Well, hello, happy Friday, everybody. Wanted to do a quick little devotional with you today based on our scripture readings. We are about done um, with the scripture readings in Psalms and Ruth. Um, you should have read Ruth several times if you've been following along to pair well with our sermon series. And then, of course, the psalm for the day. Today's psalm was Psalm 130, just a fantastic psalm. And there's a book called Psalms by the Day, a new devotional translation by Alec Moitcher. I'm not exactly sure how to say his name. And he is a noted scholar. And it's kind of a cool one because he has a translation of the psalm, so a new translation that, that would be his translation of the Hebrew. And then there's a lot of little footnotes along that kind of tell you different things about maybe um, the meaning of a Hebrew word or the context, things like that. And then he has these little pause for thought sections um, where he'll take a couple different psalms, group them together, and then just kind of give a brief devotional. So it's kind of simultaneously a scholarly work with a devotional work, kind of blending the two, um, which, is, which is neat. And Psalm 130, he calls the voice of Paul in the Old Testament. And I guess the reason for that is because Martin Luther called this psalm a Pauline psalm. And the reason for that would be that Psalm 130 is full of the desperate state of humanity and the need to cry out for help because we are in the depths of sin when we are apart from Christ. But the great news that God takes us out of the depths and that he is full of forgiveness. And so the psalm just walks us through those realities of the human longing for mercy, of when you're caught in your sin and you just see that you cannot get out of your sin by yourself. The impossibility of it. You know, we think of different addictions um, in our culture. And, and we think of the way that, that, that addicted people can talk. There's a helplessness about it and a recognition of helplessness. And sin is that way. Um, sin is our hearts are addicted to sin and we are utterly helpless apart from our great and kind forgiving God who has come to rescue us. And so the psalmist cries out, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? If God was the kind of God that just tallied up all of our sins, and he's just up there, oh yeah, no, yep, he did that again, no. She did that again. He's sitting there marking those. Who could stand in front of a holy God like that? Um, the, the weight of that sin would just crush us. But that's not the kind of God we have. The God of all creation is a God who is forgiving. In verse 4, with you there is forgiveness. And it was interesting, um, Alec uh, the scholar who writes this book was was talking about this particular word. And where was that at? Yeah, he put literally the forgiveness. So not just forgiveness, but the forgiveness. Like this is the real thing, the genuine article, the only forgiveness. That's the little note that he had next to that. That with God, who could stand with iniquity? But with God, there is forgiveness, the forgiveness, the only forgiveness, and that therefore he is to be feared. And then he goes on just to show that this isn't, you know, the kind of fear that's just like a, you know, a servant fearing a master. But this is the fear of, he writes, offending one so loving and caring, the reverence with which his fellowship is enjoyed on the basis of forgiveness and in which his word is obeyed by forgiven sinners. Nowhere is the full awesome reality of the divine nature more present than in the bestowal of forgiveness. 
Nowhere is the awesome reality of a divine nature more present than in the bestowal of forgiveness. This hits to the very character of God, that God is the gracious and kind God, full of steadfast love and mercy. You go back to that great description of who God is to Moses um, and when he describes himself. This is the kind of God God is, a forgiving God, the one who has all the forgiveness that we need. And then, of course, he goes on, my soul waits. And I was thinking about this time of waiting, you know, with the coronavirus and all of that. Um, He says, in his word, I hope. And I was kind of thinking, here we are kind of waiting maybe for things to, quote unquote, get back to normal. Um, and we're just kind of hoping, waiting. Man, I can't wait. That's going to come. Hasten the day. Let's, let's see it come. And, and how we can kind of pin some hopes to that, that life will return to what we were used to. And I was just reminded that that's not where our hope is. The psalmist is saying, in his word, I hope. That is something that is fixed. His word is something we can bank on. There are so many other things in life that can be subjective, can be unknown. But God's objective word and his truth to us is something that we can hope in because it is true. And then he just talks about waiting, waiting for God more than watchmen wait for the morning. Why wait? Well, because we can't help ourselves. But God is the kind of God that comes and meets us right where we need it. And he is the one that bestows mercy and forgiveness. And so the psalmist cries out, hope in the Lord. With the Lord, there is steadfast love. Love that. It's not just, it's not just love. It's a steadfast love. It's the very nature of what love is. Totally faithful, committed to the recipient. And he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The verse before, with him is plentiful redemption. Again, just these adjectives describing what's, he's a redeeming God. He is a loving God. But it's not just loving and redemption. It's steadfast love. It's plentiful redemption. So I hope that encourages you today about just the goodness of who God is, the depth of our need, but God has rescued us and he loves us, is committed to us in grace because of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Have a great weekend.